been a rough season. You guys are very important to me. Hi, I'm Rich Lund, and I'm just a guy who's trying to help out the monarchs. And I'm very pleased and humbled to say, I know I'm not alone. A few years ago, I made a five-part series on how to raise monarchs, from finding the eggs all the way to releasing adults and all the stages in between. I had no idea how popular that video series was going to be. All I was doing was just trying to make the videos I wish I could have found back when I was trying to figure out how to do all those things. The positive response has been overwhelming, and I want to thank everybody who's gotten involved. It really means a lot to me. Every time you've thanked me for making these videos, understand I want to thank you back tenfold for watching them and for caring enough to get involved. With that said though, it's time for us to talk about something that's going to be a little bit uncomfortable to hear. I'm expecting some dislikes, but I really feel it would be irresponsible of me to not bring it up, to not talk about it, and just keep on operating as if it didn't exist. That topic is and this is a mouthful and I'm probably going to pronounce it wrong, Afriocystis electroscura, also known as OE bacteria. The goal of this video that you're watching right now is to help educate you as to what OE bacteria is, what its life cycle is, and how prevalent its population is here in North America. Now the second video, which should be out right now too, I'm going to release these both on the same day, is on how to test for OE bacteria on a freshly emerged monarch. But before we go any further, so that way there's no surprises, let's talk about that uncomfortable part. In a previous video, I mentioned that the summer of 2016, last summer, I only collected and found 30 eggs. Well, I never mentioned this then, but I only released 29 of those 30. You see, one of my monarchs that I raised was infected with OE bacteria. And for the first time ever, I had to do something I was not happy to do at all. I had to intentionally euthanize one of the monarchs that I raised. I didn't like it. I didn't enjoy it. And I do hope you watch the rest of this video in order to understand why I felt that was necessary. So what is OE bacteria? Well, it's a bacterial parasite and it's a protozoan. So a single-celled parasite that needs a host to live. It's considered an obligate parasite. That means that in order to complete its life cycle, it does need to find a suitable host. And for this parasite, the only known hosts are either the monarch butterfly or the queen butterfly. For this bacteria, it cannot live without those two species. So for this reason, it's accepted that this bacterial parasite co-evolved with at least one or both of these two species somewhere within their 250,000 year history on Earth. OE bacteria begins its life cycle as spores that contain eight bacteria within them. These spores are on freshly emerged adults that have come out of the pupa and they're along the abdomen primarily. When a female goes to lay an egg, that egg then has some of these spores left on it, along with around the leaf where she touched. So when a new and fresh caterpillar emerges, one of the first meals is that protein-rich egg casing that it just came out of. The caterpillar ends up ingesting some of these spores, also some from the fresh leaf nearby. And so there's a high chance that if the mother was infected, now the caterpillar has become infected as well. Now during that time, once the caterpillar has eaten the spores and is starting to develop, the digestive juices within the caterpillar actually break open that spore casing. The bacteria are now inside of the caterpillar and they begin to use resources from the caterpillar to multiply. They grow in number throughout that life stage of the caterpillar, multiplying as the days go by. Once the caterpillar starts to pupate and goes into a chrysalis, a lot of changes are happening with that caterpillar as it forms itself into the adult butterfly. And during that time, the bacteria still continue to multiply. In some cases, they've multiplied in such a large number that the actual butterfly doesn't fully develop. The pupa looks kind of brown and spotted with different colors, and it never emerges as an adult. Those are the heavily infected cases. 
In other times, though, the adult does emerge, but it's very deformed. A lot of the resources went towards the bacteria multiplying. Not enough was there for the butterfly to form as a fully functional adult. But again, those are the heavily infected cases. In other cases, though, most cases, the butterfly can still emerge as an adult, and in fact, it looks healthy and ready to go. A few days before the adult is going to emerge, if it's still able to, each individual bacteria within it kind of toughens up on its outer cell wall. And within that, it still divides three more times. So that's two to the third power. You get eight bacteria inside of this casing, which is now a spore. Once the adult emerges, if it's still able to do so, it comes out of the, the chrysalis looking very healthy, but it has these spores primarily along its abdomen, but also in other parts of its body. These spores now protect the bacteria, and they lie dormant inside. The spores protect them from all sorts of weather conditions, and they lie dormant until another caterpillar ends up eating them, and the life cycle just starts over from there. So did I really have to euthanize the one monarch that I found that had infection. Well, let's go a little bit further with this. Here's a rough, basic, simplified map that shows the three major populations of monarch butterflies here in North America. You have in yellow the East of the Rockies population. That's the one that we deal with here in Michigan, the ones that migrate down to Mexico and back. Then West of the Rockies in orange, you have that population that does do migration, but pretty much stays in the western part of the United States. And then also, if you notice, down the southern tip of Florida, they have labeled in green a population of monarchs that actually stays and breeds all year round. They are nonstop with their laying of eggs and repeating that life cycle. Some also suspect that it's possible some of those at the southern tip of Florida do migrate to Mexico and back, but I've never heard any real conclusive evidence of that yet. Well, these populations have been studied over certain years in order to try to gauge how infectious is the OE bacteria in these populations. How widespread, how prominent is it? And I wish that we had more recent data. I was not able to find any, but here's some studies since we discovered OE bacteria back in the 1960s up until 1997. You can see from the data that was collected the population east of the Rockies has fluctuated a little bit, but has never really been above 10%. Over there on that y-axis, those numbers are reflecting the fraction, the decimal percentage of the population that was infected. So 1 would be 100%, 0.5 is 50%, etc. West of the Rockies, though, on the years studied, that population was right around 30 to 40 percent. About a third of the monarchs west of the Rockies are infected with OE. And the highest infection rates, though it was only four data points that we've got, those came from the population that's at the tip of Florida. It is the most widespread and while there's only four data points to really look at, it was anywhere from 70 percent all the way up to about 90 percent. But again, as we said, didn't this bacteria co-evolve with the monarch butterfly? Isn't this just natural and we shouldn't worry too much about it? Well, yes and no. See, things have changed and it's us, the humans. We're interfering with this and we are changing how widespread the OE bacteria is. In recent years, there's emerged certain companies that are raising monarchs and selling them, distributing them out to any buyers who want them in order to release them for special events like weddings, funerals, whatever might be enhanced by the release and flight of several monarch butterflies. When I first heard about this and I wasn't as well informed, I thought this was a good thing. Hey, it's helping the population increase. How can that be bad? But the more I looked into them, the more I researched about them, the more I was finding some customer complaints. There have been numerous times where customers have received the chrysalides in the mail, and those chrysalides have had the dark colors indicative of OE bacterial infection. They've had monarchs emerge deformed. If there's this much infection sometimes happening, then we know that there must also be those times where they're infected, just not enough to be deformed. And these are being shipped anywhere in the country where people are willing to pay the money for them. See, as I looked into this more, I found that many online were already hot on this trail and had been definitely criticizing these companies for actually helping to spread OE to other parts of the nation that previously were pretty low in their OE infestation rates. So, east of the Rocky Mountains. And these days, 
I now am very skeptical that the OE infection rates that were last reported that I could find in 1997 are still that low. Further investigation will need to occur. If you know of any more recent data, I would love to take a look at it. Please leave a comment below linking me to where I can find more about it. And so it's for this reason, to try to keep the OE infestation down to low limits here east of the Rocky Mountains, that I had to make the tough decision that if I have a monarch that is OE infested, it can't be released back to the wild population. I hope you understand. Now, I'm not saying that you have to test for OE and that you have to kill any of your monarchs. I think that's really a personal decision that you have to make. I know that I wanted to make it. Doesn't mean that you have to as well. And I still respect those who decide, you know what, hey, me and my kids, we just wanted to raise some monarch butterflies this summer. We don't know that we want to have to kill any of them. Believe me, I understand. I respect it. There's a difference between, though, a family who might just be trying to raise a couple of monarchs versus somebody who's taking this on to release 30, 50, or even into the hundreds each year. In cases like that, where your numbers are that large, I really want you to consider this greatly. If, say, you raise 100 monarchs, but half of them, or even just a third of them, are infected with OE bacteria and are going to spread it, are you really doing what you set out to do? Are you really helping this population? Those monarchs that are infected with the OE, that has just increased how much OE is going to spread in your general area. And especially when we're dealing with these populations getting hit so hard from loss of milkweed, from climate change, do we need to add that onto the plate even more than it already is? So I urge you to give it some great consideration. If you're willing to take on this added responsibility to help equip you, my very next video, which should be out right now, shows you how to test for OE bacterial infections. It's a method that I found that's pretty cheap, except you are going to need a microscope. I haven't been able to find any easier way to be able to find the OE spores. They really are that small. So please check out that second part of the video and continue the education. I'm Rich Lund. Thanks for checking this out. Come on, everybody talking about the atom. It's the atom. Wanna reach out and grab me? You can pick up any fingers, and a thing don't have me. It's the atom. Mostly empty inside, but with interesting particles inside, it tries to hide. Electrons got it going on. Low mass parts with negative charge. Found in orbitals. But we can't be certain. Of exact momentum and exact position. Cause yes, they're particles, but they're also.